my power had been taken away from me. I very Mm -hmm. much had this perception of like, these people took my power away from me. And what I recognized was like, (laughs) no one can ever do that. No one can ever do that. My power has always been there waiting for me to step up and reclaim it. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to reclaim that now. And part of me reclaiming that is letting go of this story that I've been telling myself and being the author of my own story, deciding what things look like from this day forward. Hello, my friends. Welcome to It's All Magic. I am your guide, your host, and your friend, Devin Hine. And here, we'll be discussing how to make your life truly feel like magic. I believe that our very existence on Earth is nothing less than a miracle, and that we all have so much potential to learn, to grow, to experience, and to create during our short time here. It is both my passion and my pleasure to walk this path of life optimization by your side, where we'll discuss topics like passion, purpose, intuition, manifestation, physical well-being, and much, much more. I'm a yoga teacher, a meditation and breathwork facilitator, and a national board certified health and wellness coach. But more importantly, I am an eternal optimist, a lover of life, and a forever student. It is my hope that with each and every episode, you too will finally start to believe It really is all magic after all. Ready to dive in? Let's do it. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another magical episode of It's All Magic. Thank you for being here. Thank you for choosing this episode or clicking on this YouTube video. I know there are endless options out there these days, so it really means the world to me that you chose to be here right now with me. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Today, we are going on a ride. We are literally going on a journey. I sit down with Samira Gassamian, who is this masterful storyteller. She opens up her heart for us to explore some of the deepest darkest nights of her soul but also we end up venturing into higher realms planes and dimensions by the end of the conversation so you'll definitely have to buckle up your seatbelt because it is quite the ride and it's a really illuminating one I had such a good time with Samira when we sat down in my humble recording studio here in my apartment Neither one of us had any idea that we would record for just under two and a half hours, which is exactly why I am breaking this episode into two parts. So if you are currently listening or watching this, this is part one, and then you can come back next week for part two, where we finish up the conversation. So before we dive into part one of the conversation in just a moment, I of course want to open us up to a little bit of breathing. I always like to guide a little breath work at the beginning of these episodes because first of all, I think we all need it. And second of all, it helps us to energetically bring ourselves together. Right now, you are just a listener, either working out, going for a walk, doing the dishes, sitting at your table, and I am just a podcaster sitting in a chair, staring at a camera, speaking into a microphone. But after we breathe, I feel that we almost become one entity, which is exactly as it should be. We are one community, one people. We are the it's all magic people. (laughs) So the breathing that I'd like us to do today is very simple, yet very powerful. It is the four, seven, eight breath. So what makes this breathing pattern so powerful is that we are exhaling twice as long as we're inhaling. And whenever we extend the exhale past the inhale, we help to calm our nervous systems very quickly because that signals to our body that we are not in survival mode. So the way this breathing pattern works is that we are going to inhale through the nose for a count of four. Hold at the top for count of seven and then slow exhale out of the mouth with this O-shaped mouth as if you're blowing through a straw for a count of eight. We're going to do that five rounds and on the other side, you might feel a little bit more calm, a little bit more peaceful. It will be lovely. 
So if you'd like to go ahead and close your eyes now, you can do so. Just getting comfortable if you're taking that option. And let's just take one cleansing breath together before we begin the four, seven, eight. So emptying out from your previous breath here. And then inhaling through the nose, filling up all the way. And open mouth, let it all go. And begin the breath. I'll breathe with you. Inhale for four. Hold for seven. Exhale for eight. And again, inhale for four. Hold for seven. Slow exhale for eight. And again, inhale for four. Hold for seven. Slow exhale for eight. Second to last round. Inhale for four. Hold for seven. Slow exhale for eight. Final round, deepest yet. Inhale for four. Hold for seven. Slow exhale for eight. Mm, Breathing normally in and out of the nose. Mm, And fluttering open your eyelids if you got the chance to close them. Oh my goodness. Well, I already feel like I just went on a trip. So (laughs) I'm ready for yet another. And without further ado, my friends, I hope you enjoy the conversation. I will see you on the other side. One last thing before we get into the conversation is a trigger warning. For those of you who are sensitive to conversation around sexual assault, trauma, or even grief from losing a loved one, please be aware that that is coming in this conversation. So if you have to click away from this episode, I completely understand and I hope to see you again next week. Okay, friends, now let's get on into the conversation. See you on the other side. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another magical episode of It's All Magic. I personally am doing great today because I have a very, very special guest with me. If you are a religious listener of It's All Magic, you probably will have heard the episode about my past life regression experience. If you did, you're in luck because the facilitator that guided me through that is here with us today and she is absolutely amazing. Today, we will be hearing from none other than Samira Gassamian. Hi, Samira. How you doing? Hi, Devin. I'm so good. <laughs> oh, my gosh. How's your day been? What what feelings are you going through? What vibes are you feeling today? I feel like I'm just very much going with the flow. I love that. Um, and that that to me always feels the best. Yeah. Yeah. It's been it's been a good day so far. I feel like the sun finally came out. Yeah. And that that always signifies something for me. So. Exactly. Yeah. It's perfect that we went from rain to sun at the exact moment we started this podcast. I know. I know. I love that. Coincidence. Some might say not. <laughs> I don't believe in those. I don't don't think those exist. I completely agree. (laughs) So I want to kick this off with the question that I ask all of my guests, which is for you, what makes life truly feel like magic? Mm, Wow. 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 What makes life truly feel like magic? I think the word that comes to mind is alignment, Mm. like being in alignment and congruence with yourself, Mm. whatever that means and whatever that looks like. Because for me, whenever I feel like I'm in alignment 
with my fullest self I feel like that's when life gets the most magical and that's when I'm just surrounded by synchronicities and everything just feels like it flows and like all these little miracles are occurring all around me yeah Um, so yeah it's so true even one of the stories that you just told Cal and I in the Mm. kitchen that we'll have to recount at some point later in this episode but you're so right it's like when we actually start following those bread breadcrumbs more up here and suddenly it's like doors are opening that you didn't even know existed and things just work yeah absolutely and I feel like it's like spirit is always trying to communicate with us yeah and when we start to notice and tune in spirit's like yes finally yes I've been waiting for (laughs) you to see the sign or to hear the message and now that I know that you're listening here's some more exactly so well said so before we dive into your story your healing Mm -hmm. journey all that good stuff can you just share a little bit more about what you do because obviously Cal and I experienced a past life regression with you, but I know that is one of many modalities you work with. So what do you do, Samira? Yeah, so um, what I've been calling myself as of late is a spiritual healing guide. Mm. And the reason for this is, you know, I could call myself a million things. I could call myself a healer, whatever I want to say. But I feel to me a spiritual healing guide puts it more in the perspective that I'm just here guiding you Mm. because I really really believe that we're all healers Mm -hmm. and that when we experience healing whether that's on our own or with a facilitator it's not the facilitator that's doing the healing it's us yeah and so yeah for a long time I did identify as a healer uh, but I think what resonates more now is a healing guide because I'm just here to guide you, to provide the support that you need, to empower you with tools so that you can activate and embody your own inner healer. That's inside every one of us. So within that, uh, I do work with quite a few modalities. <laughs> yeah. um, so primarily right now, yes, working with past life regression, as you mm-hmm. mentioned, um, other forms of hypnotherapy as well. I'm trained in Reiki. I work with plant medicine. um, And then I work with some somatic tools as well. Okay. So a little of everything. Yeah. And that's my my goal is to have a really comprehensive background so that I can work with people in the ways that feel supportive for them. Yeah. Because I know and and for me, a huge part of my healing journey, which I'm sure we'll get into, is uh, working with plant medicine. Yes. And I also recognize that there's many people who don't feel called to that path or Mm. who maybe it's not right for them. Um, And so I I remember having a moment after like a really profound healing experience that I had working with plant medicine where I was like, I want to be able to share this with everyone, even the people who would never come to have an experience like this. Mm -hmm. And so I just try to really have um, as much in my toolkit as I can Mm -hmm. so that when somebody comes to me feeling a call to work with me, I have as many options available to me to work with that person as possible. And of course, there's like a million more things I want to study. I know we were chatting about that. Like there's so many more things on the list. um, And I know that there will be a time uh, that comes when I can dive a little bit deeper. But for now, these are the main modalities I'm working with. I love that. I honestly feel like there's a much needed movement in kind of the healing space where facilitators practitioners are just adding more and more tools to their toolkit I feel like there was a time even if we look at the corporate world like there was a time where people had one career their entire lives and that's not the case anymore yeah and I feel like within the healing space though that the more tools we have as you said the more supported we are Mm -hmm. and even as we were talking about beforehand that we'll read a book or go through a training and you start to feel like this modality is it like this is the one everyone needs Mm -hmm. and then at a different season of life you actually need something else and so if I'm really into calming breath works and then I go through a time of depression and lethargy and I need something to wake up my spirits again 
I need to choose a different tool in the toolkit. So Mm -hmm. I'm here for it is what I'm trying to say. (laughs) Yeah, I love that. And I think you highlighted something so important. And I, I've just, this has been me my entire life, even outside of the realm of spirituality and healing. I've just always been someone who's kind of all over the place with my interests and hobbies and passions. And you know, I always think of that that phrase like a jack of all trades is a master of none. And I feel, you know, yes, there's absolutely uh, a value and importance to really honing in on one specific skill and mastering mm-hmm. that. And if that's your path, that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. That's never been my path. Yes. <laughs> that's never been my path. And I yeah. don't think it ever will be. And yeah, it, it just everybody has different needs and everybody has a different life path and what works for one person might not work for another. But I know for me, I, I really like to work with people in a holistic way. And yeah. so um, I'm not wanting to just be a Reiki practitioner and only work with people in that one way or yeah. to just be a past life regression facilitator and only work with people in that way. I want to work with the whole person. I want to have ways that I can support them through every season of their journey totally whatever that looks like so yeah that's that's been my path I know it's quite different than a lot of (laughs) other people in this space but it's what works for me yes well everything you're saying I resonate with so you're not alone yeah so speaking of you being this Mm multi-talented multi-passionate being that you are I know that you're also a dancer you're Mm -hmm. in the performing arts you studied fashion design and now you're talking about plant medicine and Reiki (laughs) so let's kind of walk through this journey a little bit yeah how does someone go from those interests transition into the healing space and yet I also just learned that you are still teaching dance at this children's (laughs) theater so walk us through that path a little bit yeah um that's so funny I wasn't sure if you knew about the fashion design background or not but you did a deep I did a deep dive my friend yeah so uh well first I'll just start from the very beginning I started Uh dancing at a really young age I was like two and a half when I took my first dance classes which is amazing because right now that's some of the ages that I'm teaching right um and so I have these moments in these classes where I'm like this was me you know like this little kid is like completely in their own world like not following the steps at all and I know 100% that was me in the dance class sweet it's really sweet it feels very full circle um and then yeah I went on to continue dancing I danced competitively I know you mentioned you did as well Mm -hmm in my adolescence and then musical theater and acting came in around like middle school for me okay and that was like the passion I really thought I wanted to be an actress for a long time which I I think back on that now and I'm like that is absolutely hilarious that was the (laughs) path that I wanted to take like I thought that I wanted to like move to LA and be in movies and I can't imagine a worse life for myself than that especially (laughs) if you I think on that track what success looks like for a lot of people is like becoming famous yeah and I think being famous there's nothing I want less than that. Right. No, thank you. That's a hard <laughs> yes. pass for me. But when I was younger, that was, you know, that was appealing. Yeah. Um, and it's so funny because in this moment I'm, I'm thinking about that and I'm like, that was, that was just the part of me that really wanted external validation mm-hmm. of like, you are good enough and you are worthy and you are beautiful because if I was able to like succeed in that path, that that would mean all of those things. Yeah. Um, which is hilarious because like there's so many other avenues to that and it all and it all had to come from inside but at that time um you know I didn't know that and so yeah uh I from there I and I'll I'll jump back a little bit the very first career that I wanted to have like you know when you're like you know in kindergarten and they (laughs) ask you what do you want to be when you grow up was fashion designer Wow. So that was always there. And I always okay. had that creativity. And I I loved to like make things with my hands. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I would continuously get pulled in all these other directions. There mm-hmm. was a point where I wanted to be a professional dancer. Mm-hmm. And I remember having a moment of like, you know, I'm 15. And at the level I'm currently at, 
I am not good enough to be a professional dancer. I would have to be way ahead of where I am now for that to even be possible. And so I kind of gave up on that dream, so to speak. And then it was the acting. And um, I went on to become a professional dancer in a very different capacity than I'd ever seen for myself. So um, around the age of 20, Uh, I felt very drawn to like the rave scene and go-go dancing and I had started going to nightclubs and raves and seeing these dancers on stage and thinking I could do that and I went on (gasps) to just get you know a really shit job for the first the first time around (laughs) I have no no problem saying that yeah I started out getting paid like basically nothing um, and dancing at these like really small warehouse raves in Oakland wow but I stuck with it and I got an incredible opportunity to dance with one of the biggest companies here in the Bay Area and I was on stage with some of the most famous DJs you could imagine like people that I really really looked up to and was huge fans of in front of like 15,000 people kind of thing right yes and so I continued on with that for close to a decade okay um somewhere in there I decided to go to fashion school And that actually came, I was working with a Reiki healer in my early 20s. And this was at a time when I was just not in a good place at all. But I had started working with this healer. And she asked me this question that just like totally changed everything for me. And she's like, what do you want to do? If if, if there's no limitations, if there's nothing else that you have to figure out, what is it that you want to do? And I Mm. said, I want to study fashion design. And she said, well, why don't you do it? And I said, because it's too late. I'm too old. Like I had this idea in my head and the same thing with the dancing, with the acting, with all Mm -hmm. of it was like, if I were going to pursue this, I should have started 20 years ago. Like this should have been something that I was doing from a super young age. I should already know how to sew. I should already know how to make clothes. And she was like, none of this is true. This is all this is all in your head. None of this is true. You can go do that if that's what you want to do. And so, um, yeah, that was like a full circle moment of wow. you're right. I, I can actually do this. So I got an internship at a costume company and they mm. taught me kind of the basics of sewing just to help me get prepared. And then I went to fashion school. Wow. And while all of these things do seem very unrelated to the work that I do now they were absolutely part of my healing journey Mm. in their own way especially my time at fashion school so I studied at the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising in San Francisco and I started there when I was probably around 23 okay I was there from age 23 to 25 and that experience for me was so healing in so many ways because I was surrounded by artists. I was surrounded by people who felt their feelings, who used their feelings to create art. And I was very strongly encouraged by my teachers to put something real into what I was creating. Like it wasn't just about like making cute clothes. Right. You know, it was put your heart and soul into this. And so I felt like for the first time in my life, I had permission to tap into all of the spaces that I had been suppressing and avoiding for so long. Yeah. And to see them in a different light, to see them as something that could be alchemized into something else yes and so yeah it was it was a hugely healing experience for me I remember by the end of it and this will kind of segue into like my spiritual awakening and the beginning of my healing journey but my life was just absolutely falling apart Mm. I was in a really just not good relationship um very emotionally abusive partner and just all around not not right and it wasn't working but somehow I still thought like that we were gonna get married or something Mm -hmm. um which is so wild to think back on but yeah that relationship was just it it fell apart in a really um kind of 
big climactic way and I was right around the end of my program and I was getting ready to like create my final collection and finish up school and I had this moment where I was just like absolutely shattered I was so shattered I had nothing left in me and I was looking at you know all these pieces of fabric patterns on the table and just realizing there's there's no way that I'm gonna be able to finish this and I was I was curled up in a ball underneath a table and I was I had been by myself in the room I just was like it was really I was really going through it so I'm just sitting underneath this table curled up in a ball and one of my teachers walks in and I kind of like go into like a little like freeze because I'm like oh shit like (laughs) she's gonna see me under the table like this is super weird but she came over and she she like crouched down and she's like what are you doing down here and I was just started crying and I like unloaded everything and I told her like I don't I'm not going to be able to finish and I'm freaking out. I'm freaking out. I feel like such a failure. Um, Everything in my life is falling apart and I have no idea how to even just like stand up on my own two feet right now, let alone how to make all of these clothes and finish everything that I need to do to graduate. But I, I can't see any possibility of me being able to retake these classes and I just have no idea what to do. Yeah. And Vidim is a notoriously tough school. Like mm. they're they're kind people, but they're very much in the mindset of we are preparing you to go into the real world, mm-hmm. to have a career in the fashion industry. And in the fashion industry, you don't get to curl up under the table in a ball and have a meltdown. Right. You know, like yeah. you you get it done however you need to get it done. And yeah. so I was kind of expecting to be met maybe with that type of energy. And instead, I was met with just pure compassion and empathy. And she was like, okay, we're going to help you figure this out. And she made an appointment for me to go see like the head of the department. And I remember sitting in her office and just like telling her everything that was happening in my life. And I'm like sobbing. And at some point, I realized that she's sobbing too. And she was like, she just saw me, Mm -hmm. you know, in that moment. She really saw me and she was like, I see how much you're suffering. And I I see that like you're you're in this moment in your life where you thought that things were going to work out one way and they didn't. And I'm going to help you out. And so they they created some sort of, um, you know, loophole that made it so that I had an extension to like a a whole like quarter's worth extension but I didn't have to retake my classes so it was just it was like at that point I hadn't ever experienced that level of compassion and kindness and especially from such an unexpected place and I feel like just that that experience of being seen in that way and supported in that way really really opened something up for me to where I I was able to start healing and for me in the beginning a lot of that was just letting myself feel wow there was so much yeah (laughs) there was so much to feel so much grief so much trauma so much fear shame all of it Mm -hmm. but that was really what opened up the path and so this is why I say I I know I I came out of that experience and I was like you know I don't actually want to work in the fashion industry. Wow. And there's a part of me, you know, especially in our society, like you go to school and study so that you can go get a career in that thing. Mm -hmm. And it's seen as like, if you don't end up doing that, you wasted your time or you failed or whatever it is. But for me, I feel like it's not any of those things. I'm like, I had to go through that experience. Yes. It wasn't so that I would end up becoming a fashion designer, but it was so that I would, find myself like Mm -hmm. find these forgotten parts of myself and and start this journey of like letting myself feel all of these things that I'd been avoiding for so long so that I could come out on the other side right 
Oh my gosh. Thank, <laughs> first of all, thank you for sharing that story. I can just feel that you still feel those emotions even when revisiting that time. And the fact that that teacher really was an angel put in your path. Yeah. That she, I believe it was a female, yeah. was there to help you take the next steps when you couldn't on your own yeah there were so many angels in that experience oh. and it's it's crazy I actually haven't really thought about these memories in a long time wow. too. So to revisit that I'm like wow but yeah it, there's there's still a part of me that's just so touched and so moved by the way that these women showed up for me yeah because I was just a student you know mm -hmm. I was just a student of theirs and they've had countless students mm -hmm. um and like I said they're there to help you prepare for the real world but right. that was what I needed and so to receive what I needed in that moment I, I truly feel like it was a form of divine intervention yes and what in that experience helped you come to the revelation of I don't actually want to do this as a career I don't think there was anything specific I think that you know I graduated school and at that point, um, it was just very, very clear to me that I needed to heal. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea what that looked like. And it was kind of scary because yes. I had spent a lot of my life just like burying things, like putting things in like a metaphorical box in my brain and like shoving them in the corner and being like, we're just not going to talk about that or mm -hmm. think about that, mm -hmm. um, thinking that that was going to work. Um but yeah, I just, I knew that I had to, to take care of myself and to prioritize taking care of myself for at least a little while and ended up being a longer while than that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just somewhere along the way, I think I started to connect with a deeper purpose and it just never really resonated to go. I, I had thoughts of um, wanting to maybe start my own clothing line, but there was no no resonating in terms of like going to get a job at some established company in the industry. Yeah. I kind of thought maybe I'll forge my own path with this. Mm -hmm. And I'm still open to the possibility very much so that, yeah. that one day that fashion design experience will come into play yeah. in my business and my path now um, but at least at the at the this moment in time it's it's not at the forefront yeah and I also love what you had said about even if you don't use your degree or you take a training and you don't end up using that modality it still happened for a reason I mean in my own personal path pretty much the first training I ever did was my yoga teacher training mm -hmm. and I was 19 years old and it spurred open this entire new world to me. It was my great awakening. It was me coming into myself. I remember it was the first time in my life when I stopped wearing makeup every day mm. because I finally felt confident and this vibrance from the inside out. I mean, yeah. it, it changed my whole world and I have barely taught yoga. Yeah. <laughs> and when I first did it I felt like oh I'm gonna become a cool yoga teacher and then I found pretty quickly that teaching yoga wasn't my path but mm. that yoga is also so much more than the poses as we know it's a way of life it's yeah. a lens through which you see the world and so I'm so grateful that little dev took that training even mm. if it quote unquote didn't become my career because in so many ways it's it's become everything but that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love that. I think that's the case for so many people. Yeah. And I have some cousins who are who are younger who are kind of like at, you know, either they're in college or they're just about to finish college. And so they're thinking about like the rest of their lives and what they want to do. And the one thing I always tell them is, by the way, you, you get to change your mind as many times as you want. <laughs> yes. You know, like whatever whatever it is that you decide right now, that's not a life sentence. You Absolutely. get to change your mind. And I think so many of us need to hear that yeah. more and more to have that permission of like, you don't have to stick with the thing just because at one point, this one version of you decided like this is going to be it. Yes. We're constantly changing and we're constantly evolving and something can be 
a super valuable part of your journey and not necessarily mean that you need to practice it professionally or yeah. stick with it for a long time. Yes, I completely agree. And I almost feel like resilience is having the courage to change your mind or to simply follow another path. Because yeah. even as I had told you a little bit in the kitchen before we recorded that I had this whole health and wellness and spirituality business set up. I had taught my own wellness course. It was the six week course. I'd spent mm -hmm. like 10 months building it out mm -hmm. and then I had to market it and then I had to teach it. <laughs> and at the end yeah. of that class, this was back in uh, like August of 2021, mm -hmm. I hit one of the lowest lows of my mm -hmm. life because when it finally finished and I had thought teaching courses back to back was going to be my thing. I've always loved teaching, speaking yeah. on things I love, but I had this epiphany of, oh my God, that wasn't it. <laughs> that wasn't what I thought it would be in terms of the feeling I was craving. You know, mm -hmm. I was feeling craving that oh my gosh I had this amazing experience and these students lives were changed and the students did love it yeah and yet their words didn't even impact me in the way I thought they would because something about that path wasn't it and so I went through I mean some dark months soul searching just grasping for anything and it was at that point where I decided what if I try the complete opposite of what I've done? What if I try that corporate thing? Mm. <laughs> and it started out as a joke with Cal because <laughs> I had always been that person of like, I will never sell my soul to the devil, like anti the man. I'm, you know, forging my own path. And I thought, you know what? I'll give it a shot and gave it a shot. Learned a lot in that year and a half. Yeah. And then I realized my soul belongs elsewhere. Like I, in the same way you said you were starting to open up to this greater purpose, mm -hmm. it became very clear to me that by me staying in this role that is not meant for me, it's actually the most selfish thing I could do because I firmly believe, as I know you do, that we all came here for a reason and I would not be fulfilling my duty that I signed up to embark on when I came. Yeah. And so I decided to, to pivot. And so this is kind of the beginning of my next path. And so I think just as you so eloquently showed in your story, I think having the courage to pivot or to even look at yourself in the mirror and say, well, that's not it. I don't know what is, but I'm willing to explore. Yeah. Like that's courage. That's resilience. Yeah, thank you. And I, you know, I didn't always have that. I really didn't. In the beginning, it was oh. so hard for me. And I think especially with my dad, yeah, um, I had a really hard time with that because there would be these points, like I remember at one point, I was really struggling in school. This was before I went to FITM um, and I was just going to a community college in Southern California, but I was just... I was so depressed, mm -hmm. <laughs> I was really, really depressed and had been really for most of my life. But at that point, especially, I was really going through it. And I remember telling him, like, I, I don't think that it's right for me to be in school right now. And him just it. There's no other option. You have to stay in school because he was so worried that if I took a break from school, I would never go back to it. Right. And so it's it's so funny because I'm like. Now, at this point in my life, like, what was he going to do? Force me to go to school. But just that enough alone was for me to be like, OK, I guess I don't <laughs> yeah. have another choice. So yes. I'm going to keep going to school. And lo and behold, I failed every single class because as I already knew, I was not in a space set up to succeed in school. Yeah. So I did end up taking a break at that point. Um, not really asking for permission, but just doing it. Yeah. And I went back to school when I was actually ready and I got fantastic <sighs> grades and I was really interested in the things that I was studying and it got me on track to go to FITM and graduate from the school that I'd really wanted to go to since I was like 13 or 14 years old. Wow. So I... I wasn't confident enough in myself to like make those choices um, yeah. that early in my life. But 
the more that I saw the outcome of not honoring those choices, the more I recognized, well, like if I don't have it in me, I don't have it in me. And it's not just going to miraculously happen because I don't want to let someone down and that someone was always my dad. Yeah. And so, you know, when I mentioned that I made that choice to prioritize my healing, I remember sitting in a in a restaurant with my dad. It was a Thai restaurant, actually. Oh my God. Um, sitting across from him and telling him, I I need to prioritize my mental health. And he's like, okay, well, what does that mean? I was like, I don't really know. I just know that I can't keep doing things like this. It's it's not it's not gonna work out like I really was at a point where it was so clear that I had spent so much of my life suffering and not dealing with things and not having the support that I needed to deal with things yeah and I just needed to make that choice and I think that was kind of the first time that I was telling not asking good for you and it was really from a place of just like absolute necessity and survival and self-preservation at that point of like I don't have a choice yeah and you might not get it and that's okay but I don't have a choice because I'm I'm 25 I've been miserable most of my life Mm. I've had really really unhealthy patterns in relationships and I can't keep doing this. Like I literally will not survive this life if I keep going like this. Um, So yeah, and then I think the more that I practiced that as uncomfortable and scary as it was, then the courage came. Mm. Then the, then the, the inner resourcing came, the inner validation, that feeling of like, okay, I'm making the choice that's right for me. I'm honoring my path. And however you feel about it, that's cool. That's that's your business, but that's not my business. My business is how I feel about myself and my life because I'm the only one living my life. I'm the yes. only one living my life. You can tell me what you think I should be doing, but at the end of the day, and at the end of the day, are you going to live my life for me? No. Yeah. So, have your opinion, feel how you want about it, but I have to focus on how I feel about this because it's my journey. Yeah. Oh, so well said. I think <laughs> people listening, I mean, myself included, will resonate with so many tidbits of what you mm-hmm. said. And I think getting to that place where you're seeking your own approval rather yeah. than the approval of your parents, your friends, your the, the society around you. I think we all have to get to that point because, I mean, I've been very much the same in kind of always seeking that approval from both parents and um you know, just trying to live up to their standards that I have created for myself in a way. It's like they would love me no matter what. And yet we kind of create this definition of what we must be to maintain a certain level of love or acceptance. Mm. And I really do think getting to that point of just asking yourself almost like if, if they weren't here at all, what would I want? What would I choose? Who do I want to be? Who do I want to be? And that is, I think, one of the biggest turning points for so many of us. Yeah. So I wanted to ask, because you started to allude to this, Mm -hmm. your spiritual journey, your Mm. awakening, your healing journey. I know something on your website that you also just mentioned here, you said on the website that you had a realization one day that you had been running from what haunted you for so long and you hadn't succeeded and you were too tired to keep running yeah so walk us through that what was that epiphany like and I mean how did you walk through that journey yeah so that was I mean at least in my awareness like my first big dark night of the soul Mm. and this is around that same period I described when I was like 25 and everything just started falling apart like my whole life was just falling apart around me I had this like on the surface like really great relationship with this like really handsome man and we were on track for marriage and then okay well that's not working out but then I had met this other person and I was just like instantly in love with him like head over heels I'm absolutely sure that this is like one of my soulmates and that we've been together in many lifetimes Mm -hmm. and 
he just kind of like introduced me to he he really helped me remember who I was I feel like he held up the mirror for me to see like all of these forgotten aspects of myself and like through that connection I I fell in love with dance again like I'd Mm -hmm. become so jaded and so disconnected from that and I just absolutely completely fell in love with dancing again and like really got to nurture my creative and artistic side and all of these beautiful things and then that fell apart and I was like it was kind of like uh you know as everything else was falling apart around me he was like there like the sun like you know the glistening sun and I was like it's okay like everything else is dark but like he's there and then that disappeared and I was like okay now it is just absolute darkness and I'm just sitting here in in like the rubble of what was once my life and like the life that I saw for myself and within that It's so funny because it's like it happened on an energetic and metaphorical level, but also in kind of a literal way as well, where um, I, I had experienced a lot of trauma. I had a lot of traumatic experiences of sexual Mm -hmm. abuse and sexual assault Mm -hmm. um, throughout my life. And at that time, you know, there were several instances that I was aware of, so they weren't repressed, but I had just made, Uh, somewhat of a conscious choice to just like like I said put it in the box Mm -hmm. shove it in the back like we're just not gonna look in that box we're not gonna go there Mm -hmm. Um, and I think for a while because things in my life were so messy and chaotic Mm -hmm. that was very necessary and my brain kind of allowed me to do that because there was so much else going on that it really wasn't safe for me to tap into any of that But then when it got to a certain point where things were a little bit more stable, slowly but surely, like, there's, like, that knock on the door of, like, hey, remember me? I'm actually still here. And so these memories started to kind of resurface of these things that I had gone through. And at the time, I did not have, like, the language to say what they were. They were just these shitty things that had happened that made me feel absolutely horrible about myself um but I could not call them sexual assault I could not call them trauma at that time we didn't really have as strong of an understanding as we do now of what trauma is to me trauma was something that veterans got when they came back from war Right. Trauma and PTSD, I had literally only ever heard talked about in that context. And then there's little old me and I'm like, what happened to me wasn't really that bad. And maybe I'm just overreacting. Like that was really how I felt about those things. I was deeply, deeply traumatized. It's crazy to look back now yeah. knowing what I do about trauma because I'm like, oh my God, I can't imagine a more traumatized person than me from like age you know, 13 to 23. Um, And yeah, I started to kind of reckon with these experiences and look at them. And I, I had one of these people like that I had just tried to kind of never speak to again, Mm. um, who had consistently been reaching out to me for like many years. And at one point, Um, I would just ignore I would just ignore 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 Mm -hmm. and at one point um, one of my exes was like why don't you pretend that he has the wrong number and then he'll stop trying to contact you and I'm like oh my god you're a genius that's brilliant so like I had done that whole thing and so I thought okay I'm finally rid of this person and then in the space of that dark night of the soul he popped back up and so this is what I mean when I say Mm. it was like they were metaphorically chasing me but also like literally in a way as well like this person like continued to resurface and at that point um yeah like had contacted me from like a a fake Instagram and I I knew it was him and he ended up telling me it was him and it was just this whole just really really difficult thing and during that time when all of these experiences were resurfacing the word trauma 
kept coming into my mind the word trauma and again I did not understand trauma at all at that time Mm. and I didn't think the things that had happened to me were even severe or bad enough to be called trauma but I couldn't shake that word and I reached out to a close friend of mine who's actually now um, a sexual abuse attorney and she she had uh you know started a foundation in her teenage years um for abused children and so she was kind of like the safest person for me to reach out to and just be like hey (laughs) what's the deal with this whole trauma thing and she you know she explained a little bit to me and i started to kind of do my own research and i stumbled on this article where it was like a psychiatrist or a psychotherapist talking about their experience working with people who had experienced trauma and she said that even the people who had experienced the most severe trauma had this perception that what happened to them wasn't really that bad Mm -hmm. and that other people have it so much worse this like sense of minimizing and invalidating the trauma yeah and I read that and I was like I think that's me. Right. I think that's me because you're I'm reading the exact internal dialogue that I've been having with myself for many, many years. And so coming to that realization of like, okay, I I can name this now. I can I can call this what it is. I can mm-hmm. call this trauma. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, working through some more layers and then getting to a point where I could call it what it was I could call it sexual assault Mm -hmm. I could call it rape I remember the first time that I used that word rape that I I really was able to name it I was writing a poem about and that was for me like art was my saving grace art was where I could pour all of the feelings in and so I was writing a poem and I used that word and it was like holy shit I've been denying this for Mm -hmm. at that point, you know, five or six years, probably I was in denial that that was what had happened to me, but being able to finally name it. And then the next phase was like being able to name it to another person and telling my best friend like, Hey, this happened to me. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, through, through that, I feel through letting myself really just call it what it was Mm -hmm. and be honest with myself and to recognize that I I wasn't a person who was overreacting or making a big deal out of things I was a person who had experienced something severely traumatic yeah multiple times and that I wasn't broken but that I needed support I needed support in working through that I wasn't going to be able to go through that on my own yeah um and then the support started showing up you know I feel so often there's that that uh saying of like when the student is ready the teacher appears yeah that was so much of my healing journey and my spiritual path and I would really say those two things are deeply intertwined because it was through that process of like coming to terms with those experiences and then also at the same time like starting to recognize wow I don't love myself Mm -hmm. (laughs) at all Mm -hmm. in fact I probably kind of hate myself and I didn't even know that there was a world where I was allowed to love myself because all I see are a million reasons why I shouldn't Mm -hmm. Um, but starting to kind of go into this process of being on my own and learning about myself and learning about my needs and kind of dating myself in a way um, was really where my spiritual awakening started to happen and I started to connect with all of these you know fragmented and repressed aspects of myself and my experiences and to connect with my higher self and to start to see the signs and start to recognize wow I think these signs have always been there and they've there, there's been like you know whispers and whispers and they've just continued to get louder and louder and louder and I think that's what happens like spirit will get our attention one way or another mm-hmm. and we can listen to the whisper and just do it early on which I, I could have done but yeah. I did it 
Or we can wait till it's like catastrophic. And that's kind of how it was for me where I was like, all right, like I got to get your attention somehow. And so it's going to happen in this way of like, you're going to remember all of this and you're not going to be able to stop thinking about this. And it's going to keep resurfacing and boom, here, he found you again. And like, you got to face this head on because Mm -hmm. it's just, it's, it's time. Yeah. Wow. So (laughs) at that point, when you have the realization, you're finally able to use the word with yourself and then with a friend, what were the modalities, the teachers that came to you, the student that was ready that actually supported you on that healing path? Yeah. So first was, um, just like an individual who came along who I initially thought was going to be a romantic connection. And then it didn't turn out that way at all. Um, but he was very spiritual and I feel like he was, uh, you know, a huge catalyst for me to kind of align myself with that energy to be open to seeing things in that way. Mm -hmm. And so, and he had also been sexually assaulted. Wow. Yeah. And so he had this, you know, very, yeah, he understood. He understood what I had been through, but he understood it from a very empowered context, whereas I was very much still in victimhood. I very yeah. much felt like a victim. Um, and he had started doing some like personal development workshops and things like that. And he invited me to come to one of them and it was from this place and he was someone I really trusted like I had deep deep trust in this person because I knew he really got where I was at yeah so he was like hey I I really think that with where you are right now um this would be something that would really help you so I went and I did this personal development workshop um it's it's kind of a controversial one it's called like the landmark forum okay and are you have I you haven't heard of, heard of that Please yeah do tell <laughs> I say it's controversial because like if you google it I'm confident like that the first thing that will come up is is landmark forum a cult you know interesting um, okay so and I won't get into if it is or isn't right. I'll just say I had like a very positive experience okay. um and I experienced a lot of really deep healing in that mm. So when I went through that workshop, it's like a weekend workshop, um, very, very intense, very confronting. Um, But it's a lot about mindset and it kind of draws on different modalities. And I I came out of that weekend realizing that I was the creator of my reality Mm. and that the narrative that I had created around my experience was actually what was keeping me imprisoned not not the things that had happened to me but the meaning that I made from those things that had happened to me about myself that I was you know broken that I had asked for it that I was damaged like so on and so forth um the meaning that I had made about the world that the world was a scary place the meaning I had made about other people that I couldn't trust people you know I went through this period it's so wild because it's so opposite of who I am now but I went through this period in my early 20s which was definitely like post a lot of trauma yeah um where I would always say like I hate people I was super jaded everything about my energy my appearance everything was like don't fucking talk to me And in reality, I was terrified of people. Yeah. I was terrified of people. I didn't hate people. I loved people. I didn't want people to stay away from me. I wanted to connect with people, but I was terrified. And so I came out of that workshop like, wow, I have been telling myself this story about who I am and I don't want to do that anymore. Like Mm. I can, I can tell a different story about my life and it doesn't necessarily erase the things that happened to me. Like that's all very real. Yeah. Um, but I, I have a choice in this. Like I have, I have a say in this. I, and I really realized that, um, I think the biggest aspect of that narrative was that my power had been taken away from me. I very Mm. much had this perception of like these people took my power away from me. And what I recognized was like (laughs) no one can ever do that. 
no one can ever do that. My power has always been there waiting for me to step up and reclaim it. So mm-hmm. I'm going to reclaim that now. And part of me reclaiming that is letting go of this story that I've been telling myself and being the author of my own story, deciding what things look like from this day forward. And so that was like a huge, huge turning point for me. Wow. And, and really, really powerful. And a lot of that was in the conscious mind. Mm. And I'm sure you know yes. that that's just one piece of the puzzle. That's like the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. So one thing before moving on that I want to yeah. ask you about that, because yeah. I'm fascinated by something you said that mm-hmm. I want you to unpack yeah. for me. Yeah, yeah. So as someone who has personally just said, you know, you have endured a lot of trauma and then it was finally resurfacing and yet you came to this conclusion of I am the creator of my own life. I'm the author of my own story and that it's me creating these narratives that are keeping me in prison. So what I want to ask you about that is that a few years ago, I had an experience. I had written a post on Instagram that was very much along the same lines where Mm -hmm. I think I literally said something like you were the author of your own story. Like, what do you want your next chapter to be? You know, you have the power. Yeah. And I won't name any names, Mm -hmm. but an old friend of mine had messaged me the most hateful message I've ever received of how dare you? That is the most privileged. You've clearly never gone through anything. And so I genuinely am so curious. Can you walk us through as someone that has been to that dark night of the soul? Yeah. How do you come to that conclusion? And how do you then make sense of everything that did happen if you're the author of your own story? Yeah. So thank you so much for bringing it there because I think that is such an important, <laughs> important thing to talk about. And yeah. as soon as you told me what the post was, I was like, oh, <laughs> I, I know exactly what's coming. Like, oh, shit. Because <laughs> my God, is it confronting yeah. to hear that when your experience of life has been pretty shitty? Yeah. Um, and even the way you described what she said, like you've never been through anything, the privilege, all of these things. That's what I thought too. Yeah. You know, there was a time where, uh, people who would come to me and tell me to try to think more positively. (laughs) It's like this fucking idiot, you (laughs) know, they have had just like the most sheltered life. Mm-hmm. They have no idea what I've been through. They've clearly never been through anything. They don't get it. Blah, 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 blah. All of the things mm-hmm. I've been there. I yeah. felt that way. And I get it. You know, I so, so get it. And so I do feel that it is a very delicate thing to speak about and something that I very much know is like, kind of part of my my contract and agreement of living the life that I did is Mm. I I can't just like experience that for myself and then shut up about it because I'm scared of triggering people right that's been something that I've had to really come to is like I have to speak about this knowing that some people will be deeply triggered and very confronted by it um and that's okay that's okay Mm -hmm. uh trusting that when people are ready, it will click and make sense. Um, but in terms of how I was able to kind of understand those experiences that I had from that context, there's kind of two pieces to it. Um, one, it, I'll start with what was in my awareness, because as okay. I mentioned, there were experiences I'd had that I was aware of. And Um, later I would come to learn that there were other experiences that had happened that I was not aware of in early Mm. childhood. Okay. So at that time though, working with what I knew consciously, what I understood was that, uh, I held very, very strong negative beliefs about myself from a very young age. Many of us do. We have experiences in childhood, early childhood, that form our programming. And my programming was, I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. I am a bad person, whatever. All of these different programs that we're running. And so energetically, 
that's what I was putting out into the universe. And I, I want to pause here because I know that this can very easily tip into the realm of what sounds like victim blaming. Right. So to be really clear that I'm speaking specifically to my own experience, that I'm not in any way, shape or form excusing Mm -hmm. the things that happened to me, excusing the actions of the people who perpetrated these things on me, but more so just owning my piece of it because there is a piece of it as well. Not that it happened consciously, but mm-hmm. unconsciously at an energetic level. I I carried a lot of energetic imprints that left me very vulnerable and very susceptible to attracting these types of experiences. Mm. Beyond that, I constantly ignored my intuition. There were probably situations I could have avoided Mm. had I really been connected with my intuition had I listened to what my body was telling me to get the fuck out of there you know um had I not been a people pleaser I was I was so much of a people pleaser that I would constantly end up even beyond the the Uh, traumatic experiences I'm talking about I would constantly end up in situations where I was deeply deeply uncomfortable Mm. because I was so scared of speaking up and hurting someone else's feelings or you know being the person that like ruins everything whatever it might be like there were all these blockages that I had and so that was kind of the understanding I'd come to on my own and beyond that And this was something that I actually spoke to someone who gave me um, a reading Mm -hmm. about. I came to a point where I was like, okay, I'm like super, super deep on the spiritual path and I'm learning all of these things. And so I'm trying to understand, you know, for somebody to have experienced something like this so many times in their life, like that's a pattern, you know? Yes. That's a pattern. It wasn't like a one time thing. So I was like is this some sort of like crazy karma? Like, was I like a terrible person in a past life right? who like hurt a lot of people? And so this is what's playing out now or, or like, what's the deal kind of. And so I was doing a reading with someone and I asked her that question, like, you know, this happened a lot. And I'm kind of wondering just like from this lens um, where everything is neutral what's the deal yeah and she came out of that and she said um it's not it's not karma but you are on the path of the healer and as a healer you have to walk through the fire yeah and come out on the other side so that you know how to help other people do the same yeah and so what I'm getting is that It's part of your path to help people who have had these experiences. But in order to do that, you had to go through the experience yourself in order to learn. Wow. So and I think there's different sides to it. And also, again, speaking to my own experience only, like I will never I will never tell somebody especially somebody who's had the experiences that I've had like you're not a victim you're the creator of your reality I would Mm -hmm. never say that to someone because it's it's just not helpful yeah um and I can say that for myself because it's it's my journey that I've lived yeah and I can put that out there in a way that I hope shows others what's possible And it's not from a place of, oh, I've just had this like very privileged, easy life. So I'm over here Mm -hmm. telling you that you get to create your own reality. Um, No, I've been there. I've been the person that's been like, fuck you. Mm -hmm. How dare you say that to me? Mm -hmm. Uh, I've been the person that's like, of course, I'm a victim. How could I be anything other than that? And I'll say as well, I think that there was a value to me actually allowing myself to feel that victimhood. Because I had been denying and invalidating my experiences for so long. Right. That it was almost like that first phase of healing, I needed to be able to claim that victimhood and and to let myself be 
mad and let myself feel sorry for myself because I hadn't done any of that. I had been so mean to myself. I was like constantly telling myself like it's not that big of a deal. What happened to you? Like you're right. just overreacting. Meanwhile, I was deeply, deeply suffering. Yeah. So to let myself go into that space of victimhood, I think that's healthy to do sometimes. And yeah. I think sometimes that can be empowering, but it has a it has a lifespan. Absolutely. And at a certain point, it's not empowering anymore. You're like living in a box. You're living in a prison of your own creation. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's on the topic of like, you know, victimhood and empowering other people. It's like, I'm not here to tell you that you can't feel like a victim. You probably have really valid reasons to feel like a victim. Mm -hmm. But is that letting you live the life that you want? Is that letting you be the person that you want to be is yeah. your experience of life in that victimhood feeling good yeah. or does it feel like shit you know almost like they won yeah yeah exactly and it's like and if it feels like shit just know like there's another option you don't have to just feel like shit about yourself and the world for an eternity mm. you have you have options available to you um but yeah, it's it's a very delicate subject. A yeah. very delicate subject. It is. And I, first of all, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. That, that helps shine a lot of light onto it because I can so clearly see both sides yeah. of life is what you make it and it's all magic and life is good. Yeah. And there's also a very dark truth to the matter as well. And yeah. you have to balance them. But I love the way that you were able to eventually kind of zoom out from those experiences and even ask in a reading like yeah. why did this happen this is a pattern what caused this mm-hmm. um what's the greater message and it just reminds me of I'm sure you've heard this term have you ever heard of life referred to as earth school yeah and yeah I wanted to bring this up because it's one of my favorite things that I so believe mm-hmm. potentially what that reader said whatever your interpretation that feels like it resonates but yeah. that we really came here to learn exactly what we were meant to learn and I heard on a podcast the other day they said they said this is a great journaling question Mm -hmm. if your life was the perfect classroom for exactly what you signed up to learn and master what are you here to learn and master yeah and I think it's such a powerful question and the fact that for all of us, we can turn our pain into our purpose, our mess into our message. I've heard mm-hmm. those a lot. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what you're doing as the healer that, as you said, you had to walk through the fire yeah. to come out to the other side. <laughs> so just being able to, even for people listening that have endured some horrible traumatic events and maybe they're still in that victimhood, eventually getting to that point where you can zoom out and ask yourself if this life were earth school, Like what's happening? What am I learning? What am I mastering? And how can I turn this pain into my purpose? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I feel so strongly and I feel like that ties so much into all of the past life teachings as well and all the things about the journey of the soul. Um, But I very much believe, and it's not to say, again, like this is such a delicate topic, but it's never to say like, I don't think that I signed up to get sexually assaulted. Right. You know? Right. Um, And when I came into the awareness of the experiences that I'd had in early childhood, this was like much deeper on my spiritual path. And Mm -hmm. that was one of the biggest challenges for me was I, I felt like it kind of like threw everything on its head where I was like, okay, you know, I had worked on all of this other stuff and I had come to this like, you know, understanding the spiritual understanding of why I had had those experiences that I was comfortable with. But how the fuck do I reconcile this one? Because yes. this is really, it's really, really hard to imagine that this was like part of my journey or meant to be part of my right. journey. Um, and it, I wrestled with that for a long time, like mm-hmm. for at least a couple years, maybe longer. And when I was in Peru, like toward the end of my experience, like I was there for five weeks and I was working with a lot of teacher plants um, and ayahuasca as well. Mm-hmm. 
And when you're working with these teacher plants, it's it's a process known as dieta, or it's, a, it's like a spiritual diet. So you're going into a very, very deeply restricted diet in terms of the food you eat, what you consume, how much you talk to other people. We couldn't mm-hmm. have physical contact with another person the whole time. Um, and you're working with these different plants and the plants are – Um, communicating with you in a very deep and profound way and I felt by the end of that that the understanding that I had was that this was this was something that had been going on for a long time Um, and I made the choice to be the person to clear that Mm. And I think a lot of people who are on earth right now Mm -hmm. are the cycle breakers. Yes. And cycle breakers don't have easy paths. Yeah. They don't. That's just the truth of it. Healers don't have easy paths. Cycle breakers, the people who, you know, break cycles of generational trauma, Mm -hmm. the people who are here to shift out of these old paradigms in society, like these are not easy paths that we've signed up for Mm -hmm. and to recognize that we would not have signed up for these roles if we weren't capable of it yeah and so that was how I was able to kind of reconcile for that self was this this awareness and recognition of like okay well maybe you know maybe in some way not that I asked for this, but that I recognized that this was something that needed to be broken mm. and that I volunteered to be one of the people who broke it and wow. one of the people who speaks out about this. Not I, I don't feel comfortable with it yet, quite right. honestly. Like it's there's pieces of my mission where I'm like, really though? <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. are are Why? we sure? Yes. Are we sure about that? Because that I Why don't Why did I sign up for that? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I, I feel, I feel really strongly that, um, I am a piece of speaking out about like this bigger issue in society mm-hmm. around childhood sexual abuse, because yeah. it is, it's the collective shadow that nobody wants to talk about. Yeah. And it's so pervasive. And since I came into my awareness of those experiences, I have connected with so many people who have also had those experiences and it's one of the ones that I think is hardest to talk about. It's really hard to talk about and not, not in for me, like from an emotional place, but just from a place of like, it's fucked up. Yeah. It's fucked up to think about. It's fucked up to talk about. Mm -hmm. And I understand why nobody wants to talk about it. And like with everything, we kind of have to talk about it and yeah. and really look at it for it to get better. Yeah, you know. Um, and so yeah, that's like I said, you know, I'm not quite there yet. I don't, I don't a hundred percent know what that looks like yet. But yeah. I, I recognize it in in my soul. I'm like, yeah, this is something that I signed up to shed light on, and yeah. We'll see what that looks like. But for now, I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'll let myself get there in time because, because <laughs> right now, mm, no. right. But, but you're on the path. It, yeah. it takes time. So I do want to kind of shift gears into yeah. talking about past lives, the journey of the soul, because already we're using terms that some people might be like, mm. what are they talking about? They signed up for something. Yeah. What are they talking about? Yeah. So can you kind of tell the story of, how you got into this whole idea of past lives, how you had that epiphany, what it kind of helped you through as well. Cause I know you, you told the story at the regression and it was so powerful. Yeah. And the cool thing is I, I don't think I told the full story. I think oh. I just gave you guys like a little snippet. I think I found the full story on your Instagram and I want it. Please you, tell it you all. Probably <laughs> did. I wasn't, that's funny. I, I'm like, you know, I don't know what's still on there and what isn't. Um, yeah, so I was, uh, I, I had a really strong spiritual practice at this point, and I would spend kind of like the first few hours of my day 
in like deep meditation, um, sitting meditation, walking meditation. And there was a specific tree, This, which might sound really out there to some mm-hmm. people, but there's a specific tree that I had been working with um, for a while. I would go and kind of meditate with her daily. Mm-hmm. And this tree just had called out to me one day. I was on a walk with my dog and I felt super, super drawn to this tree. And I went and I, I placed my hand on the tree. And I think I asked it a question of like, you know, what is, I was, I had like a big blockage in my heart at that Mm -hmm. time. And I asked her what the blockage was and she showed me a person in my life. And I was like, whoa. So from that point forward, I just felt really connected with the spirit of this tree. And so I was on my way to go uh, meditate with her one day. And I saw in a, in a different tree on the way there, I saw a flash, like a glimpse of a body hanging from the tree oh my god and I was like what just happened (laughs) like what the fuck was that (laughs) um and I I wouldn't often get uh like messages in visual form I I had a lot of like clairsentience which is feeling and claircognizance which is knowing but I didn't have a lot of clairvoyance so it was kind of different for me to see an image And so I was like, okay. And then I continued onward and I I did my meditation. And I felt that the tree had something that it wanted to show me. And so I was walking around the tree's trunk. This is like a really big tree, big old tree. And I saw this like, like branch twig and I picked it up and it was literally shaped like a noose. Like it was like this and then even like kind of spiraled around itself. Oh my gosh. And I was holding it in my hand and I asked this question out loud, was I hanged in a past life? And my whole entire body just like lit up with like just full body chills. And for me, like that's, that's a really, that's one of the ways that I experience kind of confirmation from spirit, from the universe. And I was like, what? (laughs) Um, and so from there, of course, then I went on to be like, I'm just being crazy. Like, that's weird. That doesn't make any sense. (laughs) And I'm probably just tripping, but I reached out to someone, um, who used to do past life readings with tarot. Okay. So I told her the experience that I just had and asked her to do a reading for me. And she was like, well, yeah, it does look like you were hanged. Like it was literally like the hanging man. Wow. Um, Yeah. And so and she she went into a meditation to tap in deeper and she shared with me what came through. And it was a lot of, um, you know, kind of lined up with what we've heard about kind of like the witch trials and how women were you know, found communing with nature and deemed to be witches and then hanged or burned at the stake. Um, And I then started tapping in on my own a little as well and had this sense that it was, you know, somehow connected to like my father and my lover that in Mm. in some way they were connected to me being killed, me being found out, whether whether I actually identified as a witch or not, um, whatever it was that they saw me doing, they they deemed me a witch and kind of sold me out. Um, So it shed light on a lot of things. It shed light for sure on like my father wound in this life. Uh, My dad was not very spiritual except toward the end of his life Mm -hmm. um i think that started to kind of open up for him a little bit as he was getting ready to transition um but he never really understood me and i felt as well just this huge block around speaking about my spirituality and my practices i had i mean i was talking to trees i had this like beautiful mm-hmm. deep connection with nature and i was taking all of this time to like commune with the nature spirits but i wasn't telling people about it because yeah. i felt like so blocked and I realized, well, oh, okay. Um, of course I feel blocked. I was literally killed for this, mm-hmm. you know? And I think that's quite a common one because so, so many souls have had lifetimes where they've been persecuted for what they believed in. And 
So for me, like there was this huge aspect of, of reclamation. Like there was a time that I identified as a witch because I felt like I needed to reclaim that. That was part of my healing to reclaim that word and yeah. to embody what that word really means, which is a wise woman, you know, someone who's connected with nature, somebody who's able to tap into the unseen forces. And now it doesn't resonate with me anymore. Yeah. Um, but it was a really important thing for me at that time, I think, to, to identify in that way and to be able to own that. Um, so that was kind of like the big introduction into the world of past lives. And I don't think there was never a point where I can say, OK, well, at this point, I started believing in this. I, I think it was always there for me. I think it just made sense. It never made sense to me that like this is just like a one and done kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I had not thought too deeply about it, but I think reincarnation always made sense to me. Mm -hmm. And that experience just sparked a period of deep study about everything I could learn about past lives. And as I mentioned to you at that um, past life regression, that was when uh, the book Many Lives, Many Masters found its way to me and was just so life-changing and I, I felt that it affirmed so many of the things that I intuitively felt and was mm -hmm. coming into about our purpose here about like what we're doing here on earth <laughs> about earth school yeah um about the way that we connect with different souls and how that shows up and yeah, just all of it kind of clicked and everything was like, yeah, this this makes sense. And this is coming from the scientific side, which I'm not a left brain person. You can probably mm -hmm. tell like right. I'm like as far into the woo woo as it gets. I'm yes. so, so open to all of it. Um, but it was even for someone as woo woo as me who like doesn't need the science to back it up. It was really cool because I was like the science yes. it's there you know exactly. sweet like all these people who think that I'm crazy I can be like but read this book exactly read this book you know yes. um because I definitely had a lot of skeptics in my life uh at that point in my journey and I probably still do but I yeah. I just no longer care about the skeptics yes I'm like, you do you that's fine absolutely um but yeah so I I read that book and I, I can't remember exact timing because you know what is time exactly. but I read that book kind of leading up to my dad's death mm -hmm. and I think I mentioned that uh, my dad's death was really sudden so it wasn't he wasn't sick um, this wasn't something that any of us were expecting in any way it was a very sudden and unexpected death but there was this crazy spiritual process that was unfolding leading up to his death, which all I, I remember so clearly this moment, like the day that he died um, right after I had found out maybe 30 minutes later where I was sitting on his bed and like there was like this huge download came in and everything clicked from like the year leading up to his death like all of these puzzle pieces came together and I was like oh shit like <laughs> what <laughs> well kind of around the same time that I had that question of um you know did I have these experiences this pattern in my life because of some past life karma I had also had a question around another pattern in my life which was people with dead dads or dying dads I had I I had so many people partners um friends like close friends people really close to me who either they had lost their dad and that was like a big part of what they were grieving and working through at the time that we met or during the time of us knowing each other and being close or dating or whatever it was uh their dads died and it was like, like I can name like probably like seven people. Mm. It was a lot. And, and it just, and it felt, it felt really present to me. It stood out in this way where I was like, that kind of feels like a pattern too. Like, what's up with that? Like, did I, did I kill someone's dad? And right. of course, you know, this is when I'm studying past lives. Yeah. So I'm like, did I, did I like kill someone's dad in a past lifetime? And I'm now like, you know, 
as part of my karma, I'm now being shown like the grief of what people experience when they, they lose their fathers. Like what right. is the deal with this? And I asked my aunt who's a Reiki healer and a, a psychic and a medium as well. I asked my aunt about this and she was like, I'll do a reading for you. And I was like, okay, cool. Um, kind of went about my life and simultaneously or happening kind of parallel to that I had this like weird opening in my relationship with my dad where like I told him that I identified as a witch and he was like I don't know what to say to that Sam and I was like that's okay you don't have to say anything just wanted to tell you and I didn't know why like why does it feel why does it feel important for me to like say these things to my dad wow. but I had just reached a point where I was like I want you to know me like I want you to actually know who I am. I don't want to feel like I'm like hiding this huge part of my life from you. Yeah. And um, that same day, like he called me and I had been working with cannabis. I worked mm -hmm. in the cannabis industry and I was very, very passionate about cannabis as, you know, a healing and medicinal plant at that mm -hmm. time. And my dad was very anti, at least for me mm -hmm. he believed it to be he kind of saw it I think there's some people who are kind of in this camp of like if you have cancer then like it's mm -hmm. medicine if you don't have cancer then it's a drug yeah um but he reached out to me and he was like hey so I'm realizing that I struggle with stress and anxiety and I'm wondering if you can help me find some like CBD products or cannabis products to help me. Wow. And I was like, I feel like I've been waiting for this day <laughs> my, my, whole life. my whole life. It was not like my dad to like admit that he was struggling. He was very, he was a very strong and very optimistic person. Mm. So that alone was like huge for me of like, wow, you're opening up to me about this, you know, thing that you're struggling with and you're asking me to help you and I would literally love nothing more like I can't imagine anything better in the world than going to a dispensary and and finding products that I think will help you feel better because this is the work that I was doing with strangers but I'm like but you're my dad like <laughs> yes. I love you I want to share this with you yes and so I um yeah I went uh, to one of these dispensaries and found a bunch of stuff and I went over to his house which is the house that I live in now wow and I remember sitting on the couch with him and I'm like showing him all these different things and I'm talking to him about the science of cannabis and I'm like so just fucking elated okay and I remember this moment where I looked at my dad's face and I like saw how old he was mm. and I I never it was like I was seeing him differently than I'd ever seen him. I was really, really seeing him. And I just had this moment of. Wow. And he wasn't that old at the time. He was like 60, maybe 62. Then he died when he was 63. Wow. But I just I could see the age on his face and like energetically. And I had this realization of like. I don't have infinite time with you and I want to be really intentional about the time that I do have. I want to make not, not saying this out loud, but yeah. within myself, like I want to make more of an effort. And so I had that, that big moment. Uh, and then the next day my aunt sent me the reading. And so she, the way that she practices is she goes into like a channeled state and she channels messages from your angels and your guides. Wow. Okay. So she sent me this channeled message and it said something about how um, she doesn't have to worry about this pattern. It's not karma or anything bad that she did in another life. The universe is trying to show Sam different ways that people relate to their fathers so that she can have an opportunity to really recognize and revisit how she shows up with her dad and this was like maybe six months before my dad died wow which I had no idea 
no idea in the world that I only had like six months left with him at that point. So yeah, I, that, that moment that I described where I was like sitting on the bed and all of these pieces clicked, it was like all of these, that moment that I looked at him and saw how old he was and that, that feeling of like, I need to be more intentional about our time together. Even that space of getting to share with him, like, hey, this is, you know, this is something I want you to know about me. And him sharing with me, well, here's something I want you to know about me and asking me for my help. And so many of the conversations and shifts that we had experienced in our relationship that last year leading up to him dying, I'm just like, I know that... I know that that was his time. That's how I know because there's so many signs, even wow. though it, on some level, it makes no sense. Right. On some level, it still doesn't make any sense to me that yeah. he died when he did or that he's been gone for four and a half years now. Doesn't make any sense. But on a deeper level and on a spiritual level, it makes all the sense. And I'm like, yes, of course that was your time. Even in the days leading up to his death, I had a friend um, who's a psychic medium mm -hmm. who just happened to be visiting me from Austin, Texas. And she was visiting me and we were driving to Big Sur on the Lionsgate. So on the 8th and my dad died on August 12th. Wow. So as we were driving for no reason at all, I was telling her all of these things about my dad, like deep. I almost, I feel now that I have more of an understanding of what I'm channeling. I almost feel like I was in a channeled state mm -hmm. where I was channeling all of this information about my dad and I's relationship and the soul contracts that we had had. And I know this is like a big, like roundabout to loop back mm -hmm. to the past life, um, you know, information, but, um, all of this information was coming through of like, yeah, this is why I chose him to play my dad. And this is the agreement that we made with each other about the roles that we were going to play. And I think my big lesson with him was to learn that I don't need other people to understand me, that I just need to understand and validate myself. And his big lesson was to learn to understand and accept somebody who was completely different from him. And so all of this is just flowing out of me. Little do I know my dad's about to die in four days. Wow. And the next day we spoke to each other for the last time before he passed. Mm. And it was me telling him, that I had just gotten approved to lease this house that I was going to be leasing with um, a couple of friends, like an ex and a friend, um, partner at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, and that I had just gotten offered a full-time job at the cannabis company. It was my first full-time job, first wow. and only full-time job. And so even the last conversation that I had with him was kind of like, hey, everything's good. Like, I'm good. I'm taken care of. Wow. He went to see his brother that he was really close with in LA the weekend before he passed. He had like a beautiful conversation with his fiance. He was engaged um, on the way back from LA where he told her, in the next lifetime, let's find each other sooner, which is so not a thing that my dad would say. Wow. And then, yeah, the next day, Monday morning, like he went to work, he owned an auto shop and, and he died and it's, and it's so wild, but like, look at all of these pieces leading up to that. Like how I, I don't understand how it could be anything less than like this intricate design. Yeah. It just feels so <laughs> like, it's so wild. Hey friends, whoa, see what I mean about going on an absolute trip together? I was not kidding. We really went to some of those deepest, darkest nights that Samira has endured and then we landed at some beautiful realizations about life, death, how we're all here, how it all fits together and 
maybe how it's all done so divinely and beautifully. So I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope you did too. Remember, this is only part one. Part two is coming next week and it is really chock full of some fascinating content. So definitely come back for more next week and definitely check out Samira's work because she's doing amazing things in this world. If you enjoyed this conversation, as always, please share it with a family member or friend. You might be surprised at how difficult it can be for a podcast to spread from ear to ear except for word of mouth. So thank you for those of you who are sharing this with the people that you love as well. And just know that it really means a lot to me. Okay, I will see you next week. I already cannot wait. And until then, Goodbye for now, my friends.